Hey everyone, my name is Chris Bazzoli. I'm an emergency medicine physician, flight physician, and have a subspecialty expertise in wilderness and environmental medicine. Go ahead and strap on your seatbelts. We're going to cover a lot of material pretty quickly here because we want you to be able to safely and effectively respond to an emergency outside of the hospital walls. First thing to do when responding to an emergency outside of the hospital walls, or even sometimes inside of the hospital walls when things get hectic, is take a moment, stop, take a deep breath, and take a second to think. When we're in a really stressful environment, the first thing to go is our frontal cortex. So it's important to take that second, kind of calm ourselves, and collect ourselves so that we can appropriately and effectively respond to the situation. We start off by responding to the situation by surveying the scene and always remembering that it is our safety that is of paramount importance. Now, hopefully all of us still have five fingers. So when things really get stressful, just go ahead and throw out your hand and count off all five fingers. So number one, you're number one. Look around, are you safe right now where you're at? And are you gonna be safe throughout the duration of your response to this emergency? Think about the hazards that are in front of you, but also potential hazards as things change. Is this fire moving my way? Are the tides rising? Is the traffic pattern putting me at risk? These are all things you need to think about before even entering the scene. Number two, what happened to you? Try to take a look and see what happened to the patient from afar. See if you can gather any information about the mechanism of injury and what you'll need to do in order to help them. The third thing, don't get it on me. This is any degree of body substance isolation that you can reasonably perform. If you have gloves, go ahead and put them on. If you've got sunglasses, go ahead and wear them. That protection is better than nothing. Four, are there any more? This is a classic issue in pre-hospital response. The patient that is screaming is gonna get your attention, but it's the patient laying face down in the ditch with only a slight moan that could be the sickest. So make sure that you're surveying the entire scene and know how many patients there are that need your help. The fifth thing, does the patient look visibly dead or alive? This will give you a general impression of acuity and where you need to begin your efforts. We won't go into triage in depth here, but feel free to ask your instructors questions as we get into the hands-on section, as this could be a totally separate lecture in its own. Finally, one of the most important portions of the scene survey is making sure that you're going back and reassessing your safety, reassessing what happened to your patients, reassessing how you can protect yourself, if there are any further patients, and reassessing their condition as you respond and as things change. This is a fluid process. Now we've sized up the scene and ensured our safety. Now it's time to approach the patient, get their consent, and then act to help them. We approach the patient within line of sight if we reasonably can. If you can't, just do your best. Try to get their consent if they're able to talk with you. This can all be a one-liner. Hello, my name is Chris. I'm an emergency medicine doctor. Can I help you? What happened? With just a, a few quick questions, you can start to get a good idea of how injured your patient is and their level of consciousness, what their mechanism of injury is, and it will help you begin going into your primary survey. That's where you start to act. Remember that the primary survey is a stop and fix situation. The whole goal of the primary survey is to rapidly identify, stop and fix immediate life threats. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. You do not win the game if you don't stop and fix at each level. And this is one of those mnemonics that we're gonna pound into you because when you're in a stressful situation, and it makes it difficult to think through things. So it's easier to fall back on mnemonics and learning tools that you have just uh, repetitiously pounded into your brain. This is one of them. So March begins with M, which stands for massive hemorrhage. If there is a massive hemorrhage, control it as quickly as you can. These should be pretty obvious, should be arterial bleeds or very brisk venous bleeds or obvious amputations. After M is A. A stands for airway and C-spine. Basic airway maneuvers and then trying to stabilize the C-spine as you move through your assessment. R is for respiratory status. C is for circulatory status. And then H stands for both hypo and hyperthermia. 
fancy way of saying environmental factors. And then also height versus helo. So what is your disposition going to be? And these are important differences in March, the M and the H. And the reason that we use the mnemonic March instead of our classic ABCs. Because when we're in a wilderness setting or any setting where there's going to be a delay to transfer time, we're at a special disadvantage due to lack of resuscitative fluids as well as an abundance of time. So in the march, it's really important that we begin with M to promptly control any hemorrhage that is severe. Any shock state is going to be beget the other shock states. So if we can control and prevent hypovolemic shock, it'll really help our patient in the long run be able to handle the stress of the injury, handle the environment, handle the transport. We also, in the field, lack resuscitative fluids. Most of us are not hiking around with several units of packed blood cells. So there's really not much we can do to replace fluid once it's lost. It's really important to prevent it. One of the greatest tools we can use to quickly control massive hemorrhages are tourniquets. Now a decade ago, the teaching and collective wisdom was that if you're placing a tourniquet on, you really are sacrificing the limb distal to that placement site. After a decade of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've learned that that's really not the best use for tourniquets. Tourniquets can safely be applied, and if correctly applied, can save lives. From the data that we've gathered thus far, you have at least two hours of tourniquet application time before any long-term damage is being uh, brought upon those tissues, either ischemia of muscle tissue, nervous tissue, you probably even have up to four hours of tourniquet placement time before doing long-term damage. So if you believe that this is a massive hemorrhage, go ahead and place the tourniquet, control the bleeding so that you can move on with the rest of your primary survey. Be sure to mark the time that you place that tourniquet, make sure you're placing it high and tight, make sure you're placing it correctly, and then as you finish your primary survey, and if time to transport is delayed long enough, you can reevaluate whether you still need that tourniquet. So remember, place the tourniquet correctly and you have at least two hours to safely have that tourniquet on before any long-term damage would be done. This gets into the second point as well, and that in these response situations outside of the hospital, time is one of our most abundant resources and usually one of our greatest enemies. So try to use that time wisely. Like I said, put the tourniquet on and complete your primary survey. You can always reassess the tourniquet later. Similarly, we put that hike versus helo at the end of March because we want you to start thinking about what other resources do I need and what's my final disposition for this patient. Try wherever possible to act in parallel. Get multiple gears turning at the same time so that you can treat your patient most effectively and get them to the care they need. In summary, when responding to an emergency outside of the hospital walls, it's important to just take a couple of brief seconds to stop, take a deep breath, collect yourself. Once you've done that, complete your scene survey, always keeping your safety at the forefront of your mind and reassess this scene whenever necessary. You want to stop and fix any problems in the prim primary survey. Remember your March mnemonic, just go through it. And if things change, go through it again. Make sure you didn't miss something. Finally, as we finish with the primary survey, make sure to try to get as many gears running as possible at the same time to act in parallel, to try to get your patient to the best care that they can receive as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. The next slide is just a couple of references, and I look forward to seeing you in the hands-on session.